The following broadcast has been approved by Outcasted OC. Viewer discretion is advised. Incoming transmission in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. What's up everyone? It's Mugam Ross from Outcasted OC giving you this week's Smackdown review and we're just going to dive straight in because there is a lot to get through. We get to see what the new King and Queen of the Ring crowns look like. I like them. They're a lot more um, not looking plasticky like last year's one. They're looking very medallion, very prestigious, whereas last year's, well not last year's, the last time they did it, they didn't look that great except for Xavier Woods when he got the second version of it. That was very anime-esque and it looked really cool. But yeah, I like them. They were interesting. We open the show with Bianca Bella versus Tiffany Stratton. I know there was controversy with what was going on with Twitter and everything, but I'm going to subside my viewpoint on that just to talk about the actual match and everything that's going on. Um, I think both Bianca and Tiffany really just worked through the match and did great with what they had. There were some really cool lock-up moments where Bianca was like, nah, you're not locking me up. Just pushed her straight into the ring post, which turned into... A short war and a cheap slap came from Tiffany. Then Bianca got some really interesting offense, but any time it started getting anywhere, Tiff was smart to grab a Bianca's braid, slam her down with it, or pull her away, things like that. There was a really cool moment where Tiff stops Bianca doing kind of one of her flips and just kicks her. Um, but Bianca comes back with a bit of a vengeance and hits a very interesting gut buster, but held her knee because her knee was knee is still playing up it's not 100% from the first match she had and also hits a moonsault gets a two count Bianca rained down right hands until Tiffany saw the moment to grab the braid once again and escaped but as she did Bianca pulled the braid back and got Tiff hitting into the turnbuckle which looked nasty um, Bianca had a really bad like leg locked in the ring kind of moment and I had a thought that was going to be a genuine injury I was really worried what happened there um, and Tiff kept focusing Bianca's leg we get right towards the end where Tiff, Tiff dodged a first KOD landing on her feet then hits the stop like runs to the ropes hits the stomp for a two um, Tiff, Tiff also goes to hit um, one of her signature flips into the back elbow she does in the top corner when Bianca got back up Bianca countered with a crazy German and like I don't know what happened there but Tiff didn't look fully ready but the way she sold it looked like she got folded in half and it was crazy um, then there was an incredible clothesline that was hit Tiff hits an eye rake as well uh, while Bianca is down Tiffany finally goes to hit that prettiest moonsault. Bianca countered it when Tiff was at the top so Tiff lands straight onto the turnbuckle and the metal and it looked nasty to help Bianca lift her up, get the KOD and assisted KOD from the top turnbuckle for a free count so Bianca Belair goes on and I kind of saw this coming not because of the Twitter controversy that everyone was going to say Tiff's going to be punished, she's going to lose her match. I saw kind of the lead up to Bianca and Jade from once they were both announced they were in the same bracket they had a chance to fight each other I felt like they were leading to that way but we will get into what happened that very quickly changed that for me we have Logan Paul walking backstage and has a stare down with LA Knight and Nick Aldis tries to stop the two of them having kind of a fight and LA Knight kind of just says bye champ to him kind of like smirky like yeah I got your number I, I'm I know you don't like me. Um, we had an interview with Jade about her match against Nia Jax. Says so she's a beast. She's the like immovable force. She's a powerhouse. But for me, she's just someone in my way. Bianca comes out and joins them. Says it was great to put Tiffy in timeout. Because what time is it? She went night night. And um, both Jade and Bianca were taking a mic and having a laugh about it. And I thought that was really cool to have that kind of moment. Um... Jade asked the more serious question of how's the knee and Bianca said don't worry about it if I've got to stand across from you the ring next week it'll be fine which I thought was a very cool friends but know that if we got to fight we'll fight type of energy and I liked that 
Um, we also had a kind of walk off in that moment, saying like, "Yo, I'll take it one match at a time." Then we get Tamatanga hyping himself up. Uh, saying his weird noises, the weird grunts. He used to do this when he was a heel in Bullet Club. Um, not as predominant, but he did it like in more animalistic tactics. So I think that's what they're trying to do. Uh, Tongaloa follows him along, um, but Heyman kind of holds Solo back for a moment and goes, how he spoke to the tribal chief today. And Solo's like, all the time, wise man. I'm speaking to him all the time. And uh, Heyman just looks like, what? Why Why am I being forgotten then? Like, why is he not speaking to me? I don't think Solo actually is talking to Roman. I think Solo's playing along Heyman at his own game here. Uh, we get LA Knight responding, saying, let me talk to you. When you talk about LA Knight and you talk about the bloodline, it goes back. But it's time for some new introductions. There's a new bloodline. And this Timmy, Tammy, Timmy, Tamatonga... I'm going to introduce you to a BFC and I'll progress and I'll introduce my head to that crown. Kamala Hayes walks up and intro interrupts a beast like, oh, if we're talking about introductions, you should introduce me to SmackDown, seeing as you know, I was the number one draft. Uh, LA Knight does kind of like a sports analogy of being like, oh yeah, when was this season this person got drafted who wasn't a first draft pick? Do you remember the person who was first draft picked in his year? Nana. And it was like, oh yeah, look who won the spelling bee about you underestimating Randy and saying RKO isn't the deadliest like words if you saying him. And it was like, oh, you want someone that'll get over and actually work because no one's going to say H-I-M. And he does his L-A night yet and you just hear the crowd erupt for it and he walks off. I love that. It already feels like they're building a feud between Kamala Hayes and L-A night, which I'm fully here for. I think that'd be really cool. Um, but yeah, now we get into the Tamatanga vs LA Knight. Uh, Tama rushed LA Knight, but he kind of ate those punches because LA Knight saw it coming. Um, hit a shoulder tackle on Tama as well. Tama tries to very quickly counter with putting a sleeper on LA Knight, and it was nearly synced in and nearly ready to go until LA Knight found a way to counter it by throwing him over the top of him. Um, LA Knight at this insane clothesline from Tamatanga. I mean, literally huge, huge clothesline. Um, but then LA Knight was like, when he finally got back up, he hit his own crazy one on Tama. There was a moment where LA Knight gets very easily distracted by the bloodline all standing at the different side, and he's like egging him on, come on. Kind of runs after uh, Tonga Loa, being Tama's brother, and misses, so Ta Tamatanga gets an opportunity, throws him straight into the ring post, and then kind of just goes on and fights. Um, LA Knight gets his combat moment, hits his special moves, gets ready for the BFT, and as that BFT goes to happen, once again, uh, Tonga Loa saves Tamatanga because it was right by the ropes, he pulls him out. LA Knight dive kicks them, stares down solo. Um, but as this kind of all happens and LA Knight gets back into the ring after the stare downs are between Solo and that, Tamatanga hits this like grab face buster. Um, so I think they've kind of made him stop using the gun stun and this is going to be his finisher because this is the second time he's used it. It's, it's not a bad move, but it's not his gun stun. Like, multiple people can have cutters as their finishers, and I think. Genuinely, Tamatongas is one of the best cutters I've ever seen, other than like Randy Orton or Cody's. So, like, let him use it, please. Um, yeah, and the face buster happens, so Tamatonga gets the win. We get Carmelo Hayes and LA Knight squaring up and shouting back and forth at each other, but like, about ready to fight backstage because of LA Knight having his loss and Hayes being like, ha, see, knew it was going to happen, all of this. We then go to the contract signing of Cody Rhodes and Logan Paul. Logan Paul kind of rips up the previous um, contract and gets his lawyer to pass out a new one, saying it was like, I didn't put my belt on the line. I'm only fighting for the undisputed. So it's not for both belts now. Cody signed the contract anyway. Um, there was a really cool moment where he talks about War Games 1992 and how he was a fan because 32 years ago um, that's this to the day that, that Smackdown aired was when that war games happened 
and he was like Logan doesn't know it because Logan's not a fan he's a Taurus uh, once he's done being a Taurus he could drop off that belt and make me a Grand Slam but yeah it was um it wasn't great this segment I didn't like it I don't like that one minute we're told oh it's going to be for both belts to now oh she is we're going to quickly change that we shouldn't do that fans are not going to be happy about it like you either do it or you don't like commit to it and yeah we then have a uh, cheap shot from logan thrown towards cody cody dodges it uh logan flies out the ring because he gets pushed out by cody and then yeah cody just slams one of logan paul's goons whatever the friends they are i don't know who they are if they're anyone important or a social media person but got slammed through a table and yeah we then go to Nia Jax vs Jay Cargo, which I was very excited for because I felt like this could be match of the night because there would have been some crazy spots and some crazy power moves. And that didn't happen. Uh, the match starts off very good. Um, Nia Jax literally rocked Jade Cargo with this forearm. She didn't expect it and this shoulder barge. Uh, she goes to do her sit down like leg drop. Um, Jade dodged it and picked up and power slam Nia, which I was like, okay, that's incredible. Nia throws her on the outside and literally just tosses her towards Jade's daughter. Jade's daughter screams, Mom! And um, Jade gets up, kind of like, reassures her, like, No, no, Mommy's okay, Mommy's okay, I'll be fine. To get hit again. And then Nia li looks at Jade's daughter and goes, Your mom sucks. And carries on fighting between the two of them. Um... Tried to get back in the ring, but that kind of diffused. And then it very quickly just turned into... Nia goes for a chair shot, which would have DQ'd her. Jade catches the chair, stops it, punches Nia in the face, and then hits Nia with the chair, which makes Jade DQ'd. This turns into a massive brawl between the two of them. Nia Jax now progresses in the tournament, so it is now Bianca versus Nia, which I didn't really want. I really wanted it to have the tag team fight against each other i would have liked that storyline more and i just feel it was kind of a cop out of you didn't give them enough time so you found a way to make it work of one of them loses by a dq i don't know uh i i just wasn't happy by the result it's nothing against naya i think naya's actually doing some of her best work at the moment i just thought it would have been cooler to see jade versus bianca we get a tag match anyway between diy and legado el fantasma Aston Fury and Grayson Waller are on commentary for this. DIY start off strong, hitting several combos on Berto. Um, both taken outside with the, both their like in sync dives from the top rope over them. Champa had this really bad spot where um, Angel held the second rope up and like Champa flew out, but like the, he hit between like all the ropes and like slammed on the floor really hard. Gaza was like posing and you just saw johnny look at him like not the time and then he looks down like oh no um luckily everything was fine they carried the match on so i don't know if that was like planned selling or not but yeah uh champa gets back is back in the ring and holding his own because the tag that was tried to made got stopped by berta um then there was a really cool moment where when johnny finally got tagged in he had this incredible comeback. He started hitting spear dives uh, to both on the outside. Hitting his kick combos, hurricane runners, everything he could. When he went to go to the top rope, Electra Lopez saw an opportunity to take Gargano down from the top rope as he slipped and landed on the ground. The ref looks back and noticed um, Lopez didn't exactly get off the ring fast enough and blamed her. So they said both of them are out. As she's ushering them out, because the ref's not looking, um, DIY very quickly hit the meet me in the middle because the tag was very much made so they could do it and get the free count. Then there's the stare down between Preston Fury and Grayson Waller and the DIY. I liked this, I thought it was pretty cool, especially they're kind of playing into how Austin Fury used to be in the way with some of the, some of the guys there. And how he was like, yeah, I hated the way because I never got to be a champion and never had my big moments. Soon as I left, it started happening. So it's interesting to see where this feud will start growing and hopefully it becomes a title opportunity. That's what I'd like for DIY anyway. Um, this was really cool after 
when Champa hit that really gnarly move, they showed a QR, and the QR is another video of just zooming into that figure we saw if you watched the Twitch live. Uh, all of us in Outcasted reacted to it live on our podcast episode, and we loved every moment of it. We re really went in depth and thought about these. I love these augmented reality game like here's pieces of a puzzle work it out and we're finally getting to see the creature and more of the mask especially in this video it was a lot more visible um but yeah i like that smackdown openly talked about it started talking about the qrs asked people around backstage and no one knows what's going on um showed little clips of the twitch footage and said this is what happened on our twitch page and now um they'll try and actively keep posted whatever's going on and Corey Grace made an interesting line saying, I just remember the last time the QR codes happened, bad things occurred. So I was like, hmm, that's interesting. We get an interview with uh, Beaten Down AJ Styles where he talks about he doesn't know what's next. He saw, you guys saw the match in France. He was so close to winning the title opportunity. His redemption was around the corner with the King of the Ring tournament and he lost his first match to Randy. So he's going to speak to Nick Aldis next week and see what he can do. We have Bailey and Chelsea Green and Piper Niven having a back-to-back -back interaction again. And this time Bailey's just had enough and calls out Chelsea Green. Says, I'll see you in the ring next week. So maybe we're getting Chelsea Green versus Bianca Bella. Not Bianca Bella. Chelsea Green versus Bailey at Saudi Arabia. The reason why I said Bianca Bella there was because obviously the previous... Uh, conversation and what I was going to go into here uh, so we kind of get this Mello and Randy match as the main event and it felt very much the same as how Bianca's match did of one of them has a banged up knee being Randy Orton this time and they keep playing into the storyline of a hurt knee is what's going to cripple you but yet they both won their respective matches Spoiler, by the way, Randy Orton won the match, but and I will get into the spots that I thought were cool. But I just find it weird that they're booking these knee spots of where the knee is really hurt and everything like that, yet they are still winning. For me, uh, the match was great regardless. Uh, you had Carmelo Hayes do some really interesting stuff, like Melo constantly was dodging like the lockups, hitting Randy's knee. He was um, going for very strong, aggressive hits, kind of mocking Randy at some points. And then we kind of see Randy snap back to the older style of himself, where he took out a lot of the anger, slammed him straight into the ring post, hits multiple European elbows in that corner. Um, there was a really cool spot where Randy goes to slam him onto the announcement desk and Mello lands on his feet, kind of gloats to Randy, notices this, just sweeps his legs, so... Meadow slams straight onto there. Um, you have a really cool spot where Ran Randy tries to go for his um, s like spinning power slam that he does, and he missed it because Meadow knew it was coming. Tackles the knee again, carries on going that way. Randy goes for a vintage draw and, and missed. Kamala Hay sees the opportunity to hit what looked like a code breaker, or it's a 48, I think they really um, refer it to. It way looked deadly. Um, for a two count and genuinely Randy looked dazed for a moment. Then there was a really cool spot where Randy got back up um, as they were running ropes again. Randy found a way to get the vintage Orton and hit that. Uh, the RKO got countered by Mello. Mello was able to dodge out of the way of it, started doing roll ups uh, for two counts. Then it was all over for Mello when he went to go do his jump spinning elbow. And Randy found an opportunity to hit the RKO for, on him in a split second decision for the free count. It makes sense Randy wins this. I think Randy is going to go all the way to win this because then he would have pretty much accomplished everything. I know one of the only things he has not done has won King of the Ring. And he made that very clear when the bloodline came out. He said he's been a 14 time champion. He's been there. He's done it all. He is not scared. I, he has the three most dominant letters in the world being RKO. And next week in Saudi, Tama, I will introduce you to my foot directly up your ass and I will introduce you to the most dominant words in WWE being the RKO. And the Bloodline kind of just walk away from this. I'm like, cool, you made the Bloodline come out to intimidate them. It's three on one. You could have still circled the ring 
and they were like, no, we're just going to stay at the back. I think maybe it was time-wise or things like that, but it just felt dumb. I, I like that Randy got the win over and the con like the uh, post-promo like rip into the bloodline be like, I ain't scared of you guys. But let me know what you guys think. I think the tournament, for me, has been pretty predictable. Um, I won't lie, the Naya Swerve did shock me. I think that was pretty cool. But... The Tama and Randy getting end to end, I was like, yeah, no, that makes the most logical sense to me because of everything that happened to KO and Randy said, like, look, my my goal not only is to win the tournament but get down the line to fight Tama and make Tama know. So it makes sense how they've done this. And it's made Tama look quite strong, winning two matches in a row against some decent people, like decent named people. But yeah, let me know what you guys think. And that has been this week's review. Look forward to the next reviews we have. Monday we have Raw and Wednesday we will have NXT. And also keep a lookout on our social medias for anything we post of clips of the most recent podcasts. Or if we do any live reactions to any more of the Uncle Howdy QR things or anything in that matter. And next week we will have our predictions for King and Queen of the Ring. Look out for the guys' socials if any of them go live. I sadly won't be because I am away at a festival on the day of King and Queen in the Ring. But I will still be there for the predictions episode, so look forward to that. And I'll see you guys all on the next one.